part 30 this morning we are going to continue our teachings on call to be a champion remember last week I had been sharing with you about how when you learn to ask quality questions continually you will have the right answers come your way for example in Judges chapter 6 I told you Gideon asked a question and God didn't get angry with him when God looked at Gideon Gideon was so filled with inferiority he didn't even know how he is going to accomplish something in his lifetime he was not a bold man by himself in fact the Bible tells he was he was hiding and threshing wheat and then God in his mercy looked at him and made a statement in fact the entire incident is an eye-opener to us because you find initially it was the angel of the Lord who met Gideon but when Gideon asked a quality question the answer came from the Lord can I have an Amen and that's what I laid an emphasis on last week Judges chapter 6 verses 11 to 16 is an important portion of scripture that highlights this truth to us that if you learn to ask a quality question you will have God answer you back now Luke's gospel chapter 1 verse 30 to 35 Luke's gospel chapter 1 verse 30 to 35 then talks about Mary Mary also was confronted by a situation that baffled her in the natural it had never happened earlier that a virgin had brought forth a child but here was the angel standing before her and speaking to her about something supernatural Luke's gospel chapter 1 verses 30 to 35 tells us that Mary asked a quality question she asked God how is this possible how is this thing going to take place and the moment she made that quality question known to God the angel of the Lord told her that it would be made possible by God the Holy Spirit an uncommon dream will require God's intervention for it to come to pass it can never come to pass without him all of you are silent but I'll say a big amen to that only people who are a part of an uncommon dream know what I'm talking about now please listen finally as we were closing with that point I made a statement I said learn to listen to the needs of those around you most people don't listen for example employees always feel that their bosses do not hear their complaints employers feel that their employees do not interpret their instructions correctly now Jesus pursued information when he asked have you got any catch that became the entry point into the lives of his disciples who had decided that they would go back and once again become fishermen so information is important we are living in a time of information in fact one of the signs of the end times that you will read of in the book of Daniel God willing we should have Daniel out soon our teachings on Daniel which we took years ago we're going to have it out soon but one of the signs of the end times is towards the end there will be a outburst of information everywhere revelation will increase drastically and it's happening today so if you're in the information business smile <laughs> hallelujah don't complain don't whine don't murmur you are a part of Bible prophecy Amen. You are a part of Bible prophecy. So, remember, you are in the end times and Jesus is coming back for his church. And we as a church are looking forward to that. Now, we are going to look at another interesting ingredient in the making of a champion. Which is, stay in your center of expertise. I repeat, stay in your center of expertise. Now this is important for every one of us so I'd like you to just listen and take down if you're taking down. Do what you do best. I repeat, do what you do best. 
the question is what do you love to do how will you know what you love to do by listening to what you love to talk about what would you rather hear about than anything else for example some people would like to just listen to things regarding cookery for others it might have to do with stitching or designing now understanding your center of expertise has to do with what your talk centers around a lot for example what would you do with your life if money was not a factor i'm again repeating if you would travel then make plans to travel i don't hear you some people don't but the ones who do will ultimately travel just the other day i was visiting with a family and they were sharing with me about how they've been praying for a specific place in jerusalem and for days now or even weeks now they've been praying specifically for that place in such a way that today they have erected a sort of a map of jerusalem at home and they are picturing themselves walking on that street i i don't hear an amen from the church here this morning they are picturing themselves walking on those streets and that's not all they have other dreams as well they know for the dream to be accomplished it requires god but i tell you it will be accomplished and they will stand here and testify we visited jerusalem we walked on those streets why because we prayed for it every day if money was not a criteria what would you do most people use money as an excuse not to pursue god's plan for their life when i accepted christ had i used money as an excuse i would not have come this far in life money was never a criteria money was required but it was never a criteria so we are laughing you don't know what it took for us to come from that small place on the side to this big place here it took god's grace and faith your joy is actually determined by doing what you love to do and i'm going to explain this to you with an example jesus associated himself with fishermen but he did not become a fisherman please write it down sometimes we lose focus so easily you're called to do something and you end up doing someone else's work not what god wants you to do in fact he was a carpenter for the first 30 years of his life but the bible doesn't tell us he started a carpenter's guild i hear you he talked to tax collectors but he did not become one doctors lawyers religious leaders were regularly in jesus's life but he didn't become a doctor a lawyer or a religious leader what did he do is the question he never wavered from his divine god given focus and that focus is found in acts chapter 10 verse 38 how god anointed jesus christ with the holy ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for god was with him can i have an amen what are you called to do do it you never find jesus ever using money as a factor to hamper his call not once not once he knew what was his mission he stayed focused always and today if you'd ask me the reason why people fail it's not because they don't have the money it's because of broken focus some people take jobs because they are convenient or close to their home some of you become silent this morning some people take jobs because it's convenient to their home not because that's the place where god wants them to be some work in places that make them miserable just because that place happens to be 10 minutes from their house you ask them are you happy there they say no but it's close to home 
some do it in their spiritual life as well and that's the most miserable thing why do you go to that place of worship knowing that it is dead pastor i know it's dead but it's just five minutes from my house i can just stroll to that place of worship they spend years together never experiencing the miraculous they spend years together never knowing the god of love and compassion they go through years in darkness living in dead places worshiping in dead places never making the drastic break with their past to enter a glorious future all because the place of worship that they claim is a place of worship is just three minutes or ten minutes from their house my friends what you love is a clue to your calling and talent write it down if you're called to be a musician god's given you a talent you will hone your talent every day every day you'll hone your talent you will love to listen to music well, you'll even make music when you sleep. Someone was complaining the other day. Saying, my God. <laughs> Pastor, you don't know how it is. He snows so terribly. I just smiled. I said, if it's symphony for him, you just ask my wife, it's opera for me. Listen carefully. And listen good please this morning. When God calls you, he places on the inside of you a desire to gun for that thing that he wants you to have or to go for it. You got to learn to go for it. You got to be relentless when you pursue something. Staying in the center of your expertise is important. Very, very important. When you stay in the center of your expertise, that's when you begin to see that God-given talent is invested into your spirit for years on end. Coming to the fore. I saw it this week. For years, some of them when they went through their Hindi lessons would have been complaining. <laughs> They'd have been even wondering why on earth do we need Hindi? All this going through examinations, working hard and then only to see the teacher mark you far less than what you thought you deserved <laughs> well at one point if you will only be sensitive to God he will let you discover what he's placed on the inside of you and he'll use it for his glory that is exactly when you begin to see what you're called to do I've been teaching for years in Bible college one of the many things that is part of my responsibility in being called to teach is not to just teach a subject and leave is to help the ones who are sitting there discover what they're called to do not everyone in bible college will become pastors not everyone will become evangelists some of them will go into children's ministry some of them will minister in the ministry of helps for years on end it's my god-given responsibility to help them develop in that call that's why they call me that's why they tell me come teach because in the giving of something into my hand, I see beyond what the subject alone tells me. I go beyond it. I help people discover their calling. Please write it down. When you understand what you love to do, and you keep doing it and doing it and doing it over and over again, someday they will say, he's a professional. No one becomes a professional overnight. This is one of the secrets of champions. You got to keep at it. The next ingredient that we are going to be starting off, or the next requirement in the making of a champion is equally important. View yourself as a problem solver. I repeat, view yourself as a problem solver. Many, many years ago, I saw a movie, a western movie, called The Good, Bad and the Ugly. And towards the end of that movie, there was a statement that the character being played in the movie, who stood in the role of the good, looked at the ugly and said, he said there are only two kinds of people, one who hold the gun and one who hold the spade. He said, I'm holding the gun, so you hold the spade. Keep digging. 
in reality there are only two kinds of people in this world ones with problems and one who solve problems remember you are here for a reason when you are assigned a task just highlight these words it means you are set apart or marked out for a specific purpose I want you to turn with me please in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 4 and we are going to read verse 3 please Psalm chapter 4 and verse 3 but know that the Lord had set apart him that is godly for himself the Lord will hear when I call unto him mark that scripture down please you heard our sister testify a little earlier about this when you call to the Lord he will hear you why because he has marked you out for a purpose if he takes you out of a hell hole he'll place you in a place where he'll bless you my friend God doesn't create junk he has nothing to do with junk he creates people for a purpose Psalm 4 verse 3 is an important verse to highlight in your Bible. Why? Because the Bible says you must know it or else the devil will cheat you. He'll say you're a nothing. You're a nobody. You have no purpose in life to live for. Wrong. You have a purpose to live for. I meet with people from different backgrounds. The devil lies to them for years on end. He uses instruments to bring words of utter uncleanness and ugliness into their life you're a nothing you will never make it you're not going to do anything in life and the more people keep speaking those words that the devil inspires them to speak here you find the person who's getting those words is being torn up and ripped apart and there is doubt confusion and fear created on the inside of them they don't know what is going to happen. They don't know how the future will be. They feel utterly disgusted with the entire concept of life. Some of them even lose faith in people. They lose faith in the goodness of God. But I tell you something, please, this morning. The Bible is the manufacturer's handbook. And it is filled with examples of those who discovered and embraced their assignment. Thank God for the Holy Bible. In the Bible you will never find a man, a single man who was sinlessly perfect. Except of course Adam before his fall. And of course of Jesus, the last Adam. Every other Bible character had flaws, had failures. But the Bible is the manufacturer's handbook. And it's filled with examples of those who discovered and embraced their assignment. For example, you may write it down. Moses solved problems for the Israelites. Aaron solved problems for Moses. Jonathan was assigned to David. Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites. An ordinary servant girl ordinary unnamed servant girl help Naaman the leper find direction for his healing my friends if God is taking you to a place I want you to believe that you are the person for that place don't go in with the wrong mindset live like all heaven depends on you to get the job done Ruth was assigned to Naomi you too are assigned to solve problems. Remember, you are called to be a problem solver. Not a problem creator. For somebody, somewhere. You are the healer for someone sick. You are the life jacket for someone drowning. You are the ruler over someone unruly. Don't feel guilty about it. If you are enforcing discipline. And there's someone unruly under you. Often guilt tries to rack your heart and mind. And you feel guilty. Did I overdo it? Stop feeling guilty. If he is unruly or she is unruly, you are the ruler over them. If the police 
of our land felt guilty every day that they were stopping the traffic. Just think about the utter chaos on the streets of Chennai. Traffic lights were kept for public safety. Amen. You are the lifter of for someone fallen. Maybe you have asked these following questions a thousand times. I have in my life. Why am I here? Why me, Lord? What is my purpose? Sometimes even is there really a God? Or if he is there, where is he when it hurts? Where did I come from? Now these questions sometimes are asked by people who are searching for the truth. They come from a different background. They have been used to hearing so many things in their growing up years. It's confusion for them. Did I exist in another world before this one? The answer for all this is very simple. It's so simple that some people don't even accept these answers. A poem is the proof of a poet. A song is the proof of a composer. A product is the proof of a manufacturer. Creation is the proof of a creator. To the question, why were you born? Some people ask that question. Some of them ask it to parents. Of course, it causes a lot of hurt when parents have to hear it, this question. Why was I born? I didn't ask to be born. Well, you didn't ask to be born, but you are around. So you better get an answer for why you are around. Why was I born? Good question. If you'd like it, an excellent question. But it's also an answerable question. The answers are more obvious than most people realize. Like I told you a little earlier. The answer is this. The manufacturer is God. The product is you. And the manual is the Bible. I repeat. The manufacturer is God. The product is you. The manual is the Bible. For years, having lived in a nation that had only two models of cars in my growing up years. I've been used to seeing the key being put on the dashboard and being switched on for the car to ignite and take off. Till I went to a land where everything was different and I was searching for the keyhole. Where do you insert the key? The dashboard has no place to insert the key. And it was a mystery till someone said, look underneath the steering. It's there. Well, the person knew about it. What I'm trying to communicate is this. You can be a man who knows how to drive. But you can be utterly helpless if you don't know where to insert the key into the car. The same with your life. You can be a very talented man. But if you don't find out God's purpose for your life, you'll be helpless in the midst of the storms of life that blow. When the storms of life blow, you will be tossed and turned with every wind that blows your way. If it blows in a northerly direction, you will go north. All of a sudden, if the wind changes course, you will change course. Some people are like that. You would have heard them speak in life. I'll just go along where the people go. I'll just go with the tide. Sorry. A champion swims across the tide. I said a champion swims across the tide. The tide. So what was God's purpose for me being here pastor? Look at Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 please. You were created to bring pleasure to God. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. Thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory. And honor and power. For thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure. They are and were created. Some of you are shaking your heads. When I know here an amen. amen. You were created to bring pleasure to God. Not displeasure. You have been set apart like we have already seen in Psalm 4 verse 3. For an exclusive purpose and reason. And for this, you will give an account of your conduct and productivity. 
not just to man but to god almighty romans chapter 14 and verse 12 so then every one of us shall give account of himself to god every one of us paul includes himself with you in that verse so every product contains more answers than we first realized i remember the first time someone close to me saw me send a message he looked at me and asked me what are you doing pastor i said i'm messaging he said what you're doing is laborious i said what do you mean he said don't you know that there is a dictionary on your phone i said dictionary he said yes there's a dictionary on your phone it's called t9 now please get me i'm not trying to promote any particular unit of the cell phone but he said there's a dictionary on your phone so i said show me and he showed me he just stayed with me and helped me go over it and i started practicing today someone who uses cell phones a lot told me you're a whiz when it comes to messaging did i know it no i didn't read the manual i just thought we just use the cell phone let's get calls answer calls if you have to send a message let's labor over the message after all it's got to be a labor of love well you don't have to labor over sending a message all that you need to do is find out from the manual how best you can use the product which is in your hand my friends you are god anointed god appointed products for a time such as this to some you may be useless but to god you are useful to many people who look at you from only one angle they write you off as a nobody a nothing a no gooder but to someone else who discovers your potential that person brings out the best in you not the worst in you why because every product contains more answers than we ever realized now i may be good in messaging but i may not be good in a lot of other things that the mobile phone that i own offers me but someone else is they may be using it to not only go on the net they may be using it for a scores of different things follow carefully every product differs you got to study it they are not alike that's why i told you when in bible college not everybody becomes pastors they think they will become pastors when they join in fact the bubble breaks when i announced to them not every one of you will become pastors you must see the blood draining from their face <laughs> they think well is this man trying to distract us no but not everybody becomes pastors not everybody becomes evangelists what about the children's church workers the ones who are required to minister to children then what about the ministry of helps the assistant pastors the associate pastors the ones who are as much required in a ministry as anyone is i don't hear an amen for example when you study a car the fact that it moves is proof that it is different in purpose from your house your house doesn't move or else if you went back home you wouldn't find it there what did you say if somebody said when you got back home your house was parked in the wrong place they towed it away compare a cricket bat and a sandwich the hardness of one and the softness of the other is an obvious clue to their purpose with one you can eat with one you can play now don't come and tell me i saw a man biting and eating into a bat pastor he is unique <laughs> but the purpose of the bat is simple some of these things sound very simple but you know people will pay thousands of rupees just to hear what i'm talking to you this morning so don't treat it lightly please don't treat it lightly i'm i'm using this to communicate something that is being put before people who have to pay to listen to it so you'll be wise if you take it down you'll be wiser even if you get this cd when it comes out and keep listening to it it'll increase your productivity it'll lead you into your god appointed destiny and it'll bless you tremendously 
studying your difference rather than your similarity to others will produce an incredible revelation of wisdom of God's purpose for your life. Don't always try to compare yourself with someone else. You're foolish if you do it. Because God intended for you to be unique. If you only look at similarities, you will not understand that differences were meant for you to solve problems. Especially when it has to do with your assignment. I'll, I'll explain with a couple of more examples. Mechanics solve vehicle problems. For you it's a problem. But for the mechanic it's not. <laughs> He's happy. He says good business today. You're cursing, sweating it out. I want to say something this morning, but I'm just saying something's happened. And the mechanic is glad. He's happy that he's got good business. Why? Because he's out to solve your problems. Lawyers solve legal problems. Ministers of the gospel solve spiritual problems. Now in explaining this, I want to show to you in a way that you can find out exactly what you must do. Sometimes you're called to just listen to the pain and the discomfort and heartache of someone. Just listen. You're actually solving someone's problem. You'll find someone say after he has said it to you, I feel good. Now that it is off me, I feel good. Listening is a solution to someone's need. Don't treat it lightly. Don't interrupt. Just listen. Motivational speakers receive thousands of rupees or dollars to solve problems for salesmen in companies. They come to give pep talks. They are paid. Some of them by the hour. It's amazing that most people seated here this morning will never get to see the amount of money paid to motivational speakers for an hour. In sometimes an entire month or even a year. That means motivational speakers are making a lot of money by helping solve problems for companies. Effective counselors make an excellent living simply by being willing to listen patiently, thoughtfully, consistently to their clients. Sometimes words heal. Sometimes silence heals. And sometimes listening heals. How many times do we hear people say, will you just listen on the telephone? Because often you are speaking when the other one just wants you to listen. Simultaneously you are speaking. What happens is you are not finding out your purpose. But the others are. We are getting terribly disgusted with people who burst into our daily routine asking us, do you want credit cards? But the world is capitalizing on something that the church ought to be doing. Finding out, do you have a need? Can I be your problem solver? I'm here. It is important that you recognize your assignment. It is essential that you embrace the difference in your assignment. It is important that you are willing to be mentored for it. Some want an assignment. But they refuse mentorship. Look at the Apostle Paul. He did not become the Apostle Paul before he was mentored by his mentor Barnabas. In fact, it was Barnabas who discovered Paul when the entire church was pushing and ostracizing Paul and refusing to listen to him. The Bible says Barnabas went and found him out. Barnabas listened to what he had to say. Barnabas found out what God had done in his life. And Barnabas brought him and introduced him to the church and said, He is a believer. Can I have an amen? Be the Barnabas for somebody today. Write it down. Years ago I heard about how, as a result of how God had anointed and used people, there were men of God who had been called by certain titles. Some were called the father of the faith movement. And some others were called the 20th century prophet. And there was this one man who was called the 20th century Barnabas. And the Bible college he founded today has mentored so many multiplied thousands of people 
of which I am one because I have come out from one of the Bible colleges associated with this Bible, this man's Bible college that he started, Christ for the Nations. His name was Gordon Lindsay. And when I heard about how he was known as the 20th century Barnabas, I prayed this prayer, Lord, help me discover people's call. Help me be a Barnabas to someone. And I'm seeing it being fulfilled in my life. I'm seeing it being fulfilled so much in my life now than when it was when I first prayed this prayer. I want you to make it your prayer this morning. This is not a time just to preach a message. This is a time when you're discovering what God wants you to be. Your function is different from others. The function of others is different from yours. Counselors provide answers to problems. Comedians provide escape from problems. Each is required. Your assignment is always to someone with a problem. Always. If you're a teacher, you're answering the need of someone to have an education. So do not run from it. Embrace it. Some people shun entering their assignment. They're too frightened. They're terrified. They get cold feet. Some have what you call butterflies running all over them. Forget about it running in their stomach. <laughs> they're terrified. They don't want to enter their assignment. They're petrified of their assignment. Stop being petrified of your assignment. You are a God-appointed person for that place. Enter that place with the anointing of God. And when you enter, take charge. Only a fool enters a place and refuses to take charge. There are nine exciting benefits of problems. I said there are nine exciting benefits of problems. So the next time you say, I have a problem, get excited. Problems are the gates to your significance. Someone has a need. You have a manufacturing unit. Well, the need is they need clothes. And they need good clothes. So you are answering someone's need. If you are in the business of manufacturing clothes. You become a significant person after a point of time. If you are good at it. But for that good at it. To become a reality you have to keep at it. Every day. Can I have an amen please? Every day. So no, write it down. You can never be good at it if you don't keep at it every day. You've got to be at it. Because problems are the gates to your significance. Now that's the first exciting benefit of problems. Number two. Problems are wonderful, glorious seeds for change. Now if I didn't have a problem with my sin question, I would never have accepted Jesus into my heart as Savior and Lord and accepted the seed of His word into the soil of my heart and changed. If I didn't have a need for healing because for the first chunk of my early years of my life I was tormented and racked with sickness and disease my parents would never have accepted the seed that at that time they received that Jesus is indeed still in the business of healing broken bodies. Which would start them out on a quest that would lead them ultimately into the plan and purpose of God for their lives. Today, into the kingdom of God and in the family of God. So the next time you are tempted to grumble, stop. Your problem may be a need for you to spend time in the word and to receive the seeds of change. Don't grumble. Find out what God has to say about your problem. Some adopt the shortcut. Shortcuts always end in short circuits. So problems are wonderful glorious seeds for change. I faced a problem when we started our ministry over nine years ago. I couldn't speak in Tamil, least bit preach in Tamil. Although I had studied Tamil in school, but my understanding of Tamil was very, very rudimentary. The first week during our second service, which was the evening service, we didn't have our morning second service. My wife translated the first week, but then her schoolwork 
the load of it increased tremendously. And in the second week of the need for translation, she just looked at me, we were seated in our bedroom and she looked at me and said, I don't think I'll be able to do it. And I was just sitting and listening to her. And I asked her why. I thought maybe the way I was speaking and communicating was too fast for her to translate. She said, it's not that. It's just that I need to be sharp like you're sharp when you enter the pulpit. I can't come that tired having worked all through the week. She was working on Saturdays included. And as I was seated there, I was faced with two, two very, very real ways of responding to that problem. One is cancel the evening worship. Or come and stand here and say, the e evening worship is not going to be a combined service, it's just going to be an English worship, just like the morning worship. But as I was seated there, in my spirit, I felt, I'll preach in Tamil. It's no lie. My parents know exactly how much marks I received all through my schooling in Tamil. The number of years they had to come and stand before teachers and beg, please pass my son, they know. Now, I picked a sheet of paper and I decided, now, now that I don't know Tamil that good, I'll write down every word I'm going to utter that day. I won't even, even if it's an ordinary word that I know must come in that particular place, I'll not take it for granted. I'll write down my entire sermon. And that's how I started. When I look back, nine years is like a dream. It's like a dream. So problems are wonderful, glorious seeds for change. It only depends on how you view them. If you view them as a problem that cannot be overcome, it's always going to be a problem. A problem of lack of material in Hindi now has become an answer from our church to someone's need. Thank God for it. I don't see people happy, but thank God for it. Go and find me material. And you'll know what it is to sweat it out an entire day, just running from place to place in the hot sun, searching for material for hungry souls in the north. Some of these things that you and I take for granted, faith, they don't know what faith is. They don't know what you're talking about. Some of the sermons you've been used to hearing so easily that you just come in and just move with the preaching are things that are so rudiment rudimentary to some people. They don't even know what it is. They wonder what you're talking about. What are you talking about? Faith with corresponding works. They don't understand it. Number three, problems link you to others. Problems will link you to the right people. So problems are good. One tailor walks out on you, you'll find a better tailor. I said you'll find a better tailor. I'm going to give an example. Gee, what did God look at? Mo uh, Joshua and tell him in Joshua chapter 1. Moses, my servant is dead. Now arise. He didn't say now moan. Pull out a beard, bite your fingernails, grab your hair, turn yourself crazy. Because the only person capable of taking the Israelites into the promised land is gone. No. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. He didn't put him down. He said, while he was alive, he is my servant. He will always remain that in my mind's eye. But now you arise. You cross the Jordan. I said, you cross the Jordan. And when you do it, you will have the same result that he had when he crossed the Red Sea. The Red Sea split. For you, the Jordan will split. It will link you to the right people. So problems are not always bad. They are good. It's time you started looking at them the right way. <laughs> Number four. And this is the most important thing. <laughs> problems provide your income. Your income doesn't fall from heaven. Much as we believe in kingdom living, your income comes when you solve somebody's problem. A mechanic's income comes when he solves somebody's problems with their vehicle. A tailor's income comes when he stitches good clothes. In fact, sometimes the level of income also is determined by the kind of problem you solve. Some tailors earn more than most other tailors. You can sure stitch a three-piece suit in some good place here 
in Chennai. That if you want the best, there are the best places. And you enter that place, you'll have to pay a different price tag altogether. Sometimes it'll look like those places are empty. Why? Because one person who walks in will pay for the entire month. Problems provide your income. So problems are not always bad. You got to find out what you can answer for someone else's need. Number five. Problems birth opportunities to reveal your uniqueness. Problems birth opportunities to reveal your uniqueness. You're a unique person. You're unique. That's why every problem is an opportunity not to run away. Not to say, no, 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 I'm not the person. It's for you to let yourself birth your uniqueness at that point of time. How many people abort opportunities to reveal their uniqueness because of fear? Whereas problems birth opportunities to reveal your uniqueness. Go for it when it presents itself. Don't shun your call. Don't run away from it. Number six. Problems birth new relationships. I repeat, problems birth new relationships. You heard our sister testify a little earlier. She didn't come out of an un ugly situation in her life. She would never have been able to discover the blessing, the choicest blessing, she said, of her lifetime. Oh, hear you. I'm excited. <laughs> it births new relationships. Someone walked out on you. Don't cry. Look ahead at the new person who will walk into your life. New relationships are birthed. Because of problems. Number seven. Problems are the real reason friendships exist. The Bible tells us there is a friend who sticks closer to us than a brother. The real reason why friendships exist are because of problems. A friend ought to be there when you need him. If he is not around, quit being his friend. <laughs> what about these fair weather friends? Well, the weather is not always fair. We are living in a fallen world. There are dark times too. And if your friends are not around, then they are no friends. Number eight. Remove problems from the earth and you will destroy any sense of significance in humanity. I said remove problems from the earth and you will destroy any sense of significance in humanity. Why is there significance today? In this earth. Because man has a need. He needs a savior. He needs a redeemer. He needs God. If he was a man who didn't have a problem. He wouldn't need God. Remember right from day one. Man required God. He required the fellowship of God. It was when he was not fellowshipping with God. That something else crept in. Number nine, problems bring good people together during bad times. Good people come together. I've written it like this. The doctor knows that a health problem is his connection to you. A dentist knows that a tooth problem is his connection to you. Some time ago I had a problem with two extra tooth. One from the right hand side of my jaw and the upper jaw and one from the left hand side of my upper jaw. The months on end, it had never given me a problem. In fact, when I finally spoke about it, my own parents asked me, from where did it come? Did it just come out? I've been having it for years on end. Nearly for 21 years it was there. It never gave me a problem. When all of a sudden it started giving me a terrible problem. And I'd never been in, to a dentist for my personal needs in all my growing up years. <laughs> I'd gone with others. I watched them sit on the dentist chair. But I have never sat on a dentist chair myself. So finally, good sense prevailed. <laughs> the wisdom from my better half prevailed. And she said, it's getting unbearable, please go. So I mustered enough guts to talk to Dr. Ashwin. I said, doctor, 
I'm coming to meet you. He said, come pastor. He'd been waiting for me for quite some time. He had already told me certain things. He said, if it's not there, then we'll have to take a look. And I wished that he would never have to take a look. But then, ultimately, the day I arrived and I was there, seated. I tell you, it's good to go to meet a doctor who knows the Lord. <laughs> Thank God he didn't play safe in the arms of Jesus that day. Music was being played. But music that was calming to the soul. Because to tell you the truth, I'd never been. And they decided they're going to take it out. And he said, before we do it, we've got to clean your gums as well as your teeth. I didn't know what he meant. <laughs> Till he started cleaning. Now in my years before I got saved, I used to chew betel nut. A regular pan. Not the pan masala, but just betel nut. And uh, added to that, I used to smoke also. And there were stains all over my inner teeth that I never thought much about. Because I never went around showing people my teeth, the inside of it at least. So, Ashwin was cleaning my teeth when he all of a sudden stopped. He said, Pastor, you've never been to a doc dentist before. I said, never been to someone before. He said, thank God God's given me an opportunity to wash your sins away. <laughs> These are his exact words. At, then he thought about it for a moment, moment and he said, at least in the natural. <laughs> Follow. A dentist knows that a tooth problem is his connection to you. Sometimes for others, it's a gum problem. A lawyer knows that a legal problem is his connection to you. The problem God created you to solve on earth is called your assignment. Go for it. Hallelujah. View yourself as a problem solver because this is one of the secrets of champions. We are going to close with that this morning. Some of you know what I am talking about. Some of you are yet to know what I am talking to you about. But don't view a problem always as a problem. You've got to view a problem in the light of what God has spoken to you about. I'm a problem solver. I'll solve this problem. I'll get the person out of a mess. I'll help the person out. If that is the way you handle problems, you'll find your God-appointed destiny in this world. God-appointed destinies don't just come to you all of a sudden one day. It happens one day at a time as you decide and commit yourself to being a problem solver. Let's bow our heads in prayer this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we are so glad to be here this morning. Glad that we are in the house of God. Glad that we are in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. When He is Lord, the Bible tells us there is liberty. Liberty to live for you. Liberty to serve you. Liberty to hear from you. Liberty to receive divine commissioning. And to understand divine purposes and plans that we may pursue them. Precious Father, I pray, O oh God, that the word that we have heard will work in our lives. Work every day, O oh Lord. And every word-based prayer would be answered this day. Thank you, Father. Take your people back home with your blessing. And we pray that everything that we are purposing in our heart to do this day and the week ahead will be anointed. Will be anointed. Whether it's the out outreach in the hospital or the evening advertisement or the worship services tomorrow or the outreaches, oh God, in the afternoon again in the slums or the days ahead of this week, oh Father. That we see stretching out before us. Crucial decisions that we will have to take. Amen. Precious Father. Let your purpose alone prevail. Amen. Let your glory cloud rest upon your people. That every one of them is precious in your sight. Thank you Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. In Jesus' name. Everybody said. Amen. And Amen. Hallelujah. This concludes Pastor Isaac's message.